I heard you're, you're there somewhere. Do you hear me? I do, Eddie. Okay. Uh, my now, apologies. I was out for the background. I do not know what's going on. This has worked fine every time, and I do not know what's going on with it today. But the light sucks for some reason. Nothing's working like it should. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see that. Um, let's see. Where is that setting? I've done it myself. Um, over on the right side where it says video. Yeah, I've, I've said all that. It's, it's just not doing it right. I don't know why. There's a slider that gives you a different. Uh, there you go. Yeah, it, it gets rid of me on top of it is a deal. <laughs> okay. Well, you could just put the screen or, or whatever you like to do. Um, all right. Well, I thought we would uh, talk today about, uh, well, anything you'd like to talk to about. But I thought about the idea of building a case and preparing evidence. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe those are kind of cool ideas. I don't know. Okay. Um, I've always, uh, or I've, I've heard some things, you know, I'm, I'm, oftentimes I'm getting, I get my, uh, I get upset about something or something in the world that, that isn't right now, you know, want to go about making it better. And uh, as I imagine a lot of people do, but don't always know the first place to start. And, uh, I think one of the things is like uh, uh, maybe demanding that that the other parties preserves evidence in the case, you know, and well, communicate. Well, they have a duty to preserve evidence anyway. Um, but what you have to do in order to obtain that evidence is file a motion for discovery. So one of the first things you want to do in any type of case that you have, whether it be civil or criminal, uh, once the suit has been filed or the criminal complaint against you has been filed, the first thing you're going to want to do is sit down and calculate all the various pieces of evidence that you're entitled to. The first one just simply being a broad request for any evidence the prosecution intends to introduce at trial or has uh, discovered during the process of its alleged investigation. Now, uh, or that is exculpatory in nature or required to be divulged under Brady. Basically you file a motion making a request more or less like that, but with more technical jargon to it, I guess would be the way to put it. Uh, more court suitable, I guess is how you'd say it. And uh, they're required to turn it over if it's in their possession, no matter what it is. Even if it hurts their case, they're required to turn it over. Now that doesn't mean they will, which means you need to have an idea of what evidence they're going to use and how they intend to use it. But for the most part, it's what they're required to do. You just have to know that if you're going to argue they haven't done that, you have to be able to show something's missing here. There should be this, and yet it's not in the discovery. There should be this, and yet it's not in the discovery either. Or in the evidence they give you, it makes reference to some other information or some other piece of evidence, which itself is not provided in the discovery you receive. Those are all clear indicators that they're acting in violation of Brady. And the Brady, uh, I've heard about that before and I sounds like a very it's Brady v. Maryland. And when uh, I, I had a friend, he, he brought that up as a Brady request, and the judge denied his Brady request. Well, the judge may not agree that what you're asking for is relevant, but that's a different issue than filing a motion for discovery. The court is free to look at the discovery and go, okay, I'll give you this and I'll give you this, but I don't see how this is even remotely relevant, therefore you're not getting it. Uh, the oh, court can I do that, but the opposing counsel cannot the opposing counsel does not get to decide what's relevant and what's not the court can look at it and rule on it but the opposing counsel can't mm -hmm. but i think it's a uh I, i'm trying to remember how his brady request was structured it was uh i think it was just a motion for a quote-unquote brady request you know just to say that he was he, he was uh 
extending it, it. Well, there's no such thing as a motion for a Brady request. A Brady request is it's a request for discovery under Brady. It's not a Brady request. It's a discovery motion under the ruling and holding of Brady. Cool. And that gives you that, that gives you stuff like um, uh, the the human resource records of the officers that are involved in testifying against if you. If you can show how it's relevant to the case, yes, but that's not necessarily true. For instance, if you're suing the cop for police brutality, then it's absolutely relevant. But if you're fighting a traffic ticket the cop issued, it's not relevant. I see. Have to show relevance. Yeah, what e evidence without relevance to the facts of the matter before the court is superfluous. It has it has no use other than to to delay and redirect uh, off of the focus of the case, and there and the courts don't allow that. That's where most people make a huge mistake in their discovery is they ask for everything in the kitchen sink when all they needed to ask for was what was in the fridge or under the cupboard, but not the whole kitchen. I see. So you not only ask for what you want, and you explain why you want it, what, how it's relevant. No, no, no. You don't have to do, you don't have to explain why it's relevant. It just has to be reasonably, arguably relevant for you to have a right to it in discovery. It can be prejudicial to the other side. It can be exculpatory to you. Uh, it can be the same evidence the prosecution is going to try to use against you in a court. It can be evidence that you have that they never asked you for, but you can introduce because you have your own recordings, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, let's say the cop has a body cam and you had a camera. You requested the cop's body cam, but the prosecutor never requested your camera footage from you. Okay. It's not your fault if the other side doesn't request discovery from you. And you're not required to give them information they never asked for. Okay? With the exception of it being that if they did file discovery, then you have to turn over anything that would be potentially relevant, whether it was specifically asked for or not, just like they have to do with you. So that's, that's a gate that swings both ways, when it comes to discovery. But if, in most cases, the other side never files discovery, especially in a criminal case. There is no discovery the other side can file against you. The only thing they can do is do their investigation. So uh, then it's up to you as to whether or not you give them any additional information above and beyond what their investigation reveals, which I don't recommend anyone do since you're not required to provide evidence or information that can be used against you, it would be stupid to do that. So if it doesn't come out in their investigation and they, and it's in a civil suit, they didn't file discovery for it or something that would lead that to being tangential evidence you had to disclose, then there's no issue. I see. Oh, Star Hills is here. In the uh, chat room, she says, glad she caught you live. <laughs> I'm not Sorry. really sure that would qualify for me today. I haven't had a whole lot of sleep, and I got to teach my class tonight. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um. So, uh, how about um, process of service? Uh what what are what can you say about process of service and and uh, notifying parties of a dispute? Um, well, service or notice has three primary requisites. Okay, it must be proper, it must be sufficient, and it must be timely. Proper means it was served according to the laws of your state. Okay. If it says it's got to be hand delivered or made in open court or sent certified or registered mail or anything of that type, 
then it's only proper service if it complies with what the law says is proper. Sufficient means that it provides enough information that the receiving party that's being served can identify the purpose of the notice so that they know what they're having to respond to, why they're having to respond to it, when they're having to respond to it, and the very detailed specifics, not the whole case per se, but at least that they've got notice they're being sued for such and such or they're being prosecuted for such and such. Uh, and then there's timely. That notice must have been sent and received in a time frame that allows the other party to use it as it's intended, to prepare a defense, to gather requested information, to make the appearance. For instance, you can't send me notice that I'm being civilly sued three weeks after the trial's taken place. That's not timely. Or 24 hours before the trial takes place. That's not timely. The law sets a specific amount of time that notice must be sent and received by the opposing party in any given type of case. And if you fail to meet that time frame and the other side does not waive that time frame, then that's not timely notice. And it's challengeable if it violates any of those three particulars. And then there's, uh, <clears throat> then there's uh, certain things, process servers, like they can't be a, um, a felon, for example, right? They can't be, well, it depends again on what the laws of your state say. Like, for instance, here in Texas, any person over the age of 18 that is not under indictment or a convicted uh, uh, felon can do process service. It, your mother can serve process for you here in Texas. Your son can do it as long as he's over 18 and he's not convicted of any crimes and, uh, of felony grade. So here, anyone can do it um, with those exceptions, of course. But you don't have to be a licensed or registered process server to do service in most places. Some states you do, but not here. Hmm. Good. Did I get that right on the screen there? Tileoflaw.com? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you do a broadcast uh, uh, rather regularly, right? Uh, can you tell us about uh, an internet based radio show? Yes. Rule of law radio, which is on Monday nights from eight to 10 PM central standard time. I also teach an online class, which during the summer months, like it is right now, this month we start going from eight to 10 PM for the Thursday night class, which I have tonight. Uh, and we do legal studies and basically the, the, the class is designed to teach you how to act as your own attorney without having to pay for one or how to use the same information to control the attorney you do have and know when he's blowing smoke up your behind or he's actually screwing you over or he's helping you so that you can discern the difference in what they're telling you and how they're doing things uh, and thus protect yourself. Either one of those is a great benefit to have, the ability to do it on your own or the ability to recognize when you're getting shafted by the person that's supposed to be helping. Yes. It's, uh, it's a lot a lot to learn. I, I mean, I, I've perceived it's a lot to learn over it, the years. It is a lot to learn. It's, it's quite a bit to learn. Uh, there's a reason why law school takes a long time, and it takes even longer in most cases when you're trying to learn it entirely on your own. The major difference is, is when you're learning it on your own, you do one thing law school does not do. You deal with the actual written law. Law school does not teach lawyers the law. It teaches lawyers somebody else's opinion about the law, but not the actual written law. And that's the, that's the distinction between what I teach people and what law school teaches people. I go through the actual law with you and I show you, here's what it says. Tell me what you think it means. And then I say, okay, well, does your meaning comport itself with the rules of statutory interpretation and the rules of the creation and writing of law that has to be followed by the legislators and the courts? 
because the courts have to combine both sets of those rules. And in, inside of statutory interpretation, you've got a specific set of codified rules, and then you've also got what's called legal maxims. The codified rules are generally based upon pre-existing legal maxims, but there's also lots of legal maxims that are not codified. They're written down, sure, so people can know what they mean and, and how they are to be used, but they're not codified within a specific statutory scheme like Chapter 311 of the Government Code is here in Texas. Quite a few of the legal maxims that exist have been codified into statutory law in our government code here in Texas. And how laws have to be written by the legislature and interpreted by the court relative to their creation is in Chapter 312 of the Texas Government Code. So I didn't quite I, get that, that second part. Chapter 312, it's the creation and writing of law. It's the statutory structure for how the legislature has to write a law. Thus, it is part and parcel as to how the courts must interpret that law. If the legislature has to write it this way, then the courts have to review it as written and as the legislature was instructed to make it. The courts don't get to go off on their own tangent and say, well, I don't like how the legislature was told to do this. I'm going to do it this way. The court has to follow that same structure in both of those chapters. Now, they don't always do that, but if you don't know what those chapters say and what they mean, you will not catch the court sticking its thumb in your pie when it shouldn't. Nice. Nice. Um, definitions. I was thinking about definitions. Statutory uh, definitions apply to all statutes. It's something we discussed, I believe, in our previous uh, show together, is that statutory definitions take precedent over all others. If there is a definition for a term or phrase within the statute, whether it's general or local, it takes precedent over every other definition in existence. That includes the common and normal usage of a term. I don't care what the term is. If the statute contains a definition for it, then it is the only definition that matters. Now, in statutes, you have two types of definitions. You have general and you have local and specific. In all cases, local and specific will supersede general unless the local and specific specifically states that if they conflict, then the general is controlling. Very few of them do that. Some of them do, but there's not nearly as many of them that do that. Uh, because what would be the purpose of creating a local and specific if it turned around and said, but go see the general anyway? What's an, what's an interesting example of a definition? That, the definition uh, of person, for instance. If you look at the legislative drafting manual, which pretty much every state has but under some name and some form, there is an instruction manual that's given to every legislator, every legislative session. That manual tells them how they have to read and interpret certain terms used in law. Here in Texas, the Le Texas uh, legislative drafting manual specifically tells the legislature that the term person is given a false and fictitious meaning by default intentionally. Then you take that statement from the drafting manual and you go look at chapter 311 of the government code at the specific definition of the term person there. And it says person includes corporations, associations, limited liability companies, and any other legal entities. Well, that right there takes the, the living being part of it out of existence in that definition. Because everything that's in that means is a legal entity. It's a fiction of law. Okay. Now, this is not to say that I'm adhering to the patronate natural man on the land type stuff. I'm not doing that. I'm simply saying that what is listed in the definition are all creatures of law. They exist only on paper and only by designation of the law created by the legislature. That's it. Whereas you go to the definition of person in specific statutes, local and specific, remember that? Then they will say person includes or means an individual 
And then after that, they will list all of these other legal entities. So here's the problem. How do you put in a legal definition something that's real with something that's not and say they mean the same thing? Now, this is something jo that, again, go ahead. Joinder. Not actually joinder. Again, this is where the rules of statutory interpretation come into play. There is a legal maximum of law called ejusdum generis. Ejusdum generis simply means of the same kind, type, or class of thing. And the courts, the Supreme Court has ruled that under the rule of ejusdum generis, when there is a list of things put together, especially if that list follows the terms includes or including, then they must be of the same kind of thing, type or class, all right? So if all of the list is legal entities except for the very first one, then how do you show that there's a relationship that exists that would fit within a class between that individual and the legal entities that follow? How would you analyze that to say there's a relationship that would actually fit all of them and still comply with the rule of a judgment generis? I don't know. Okay. Can a legal entity act on its own? Um, I would say no. I would say okay. now, it has to have a logical the reason why. It has to have the living, it has to have uh, a mover, a, 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 the movement or whatever that the it has to the have human, an agent. Yeah. It has to have a human agent. A living, there is no such thing as a living legal entity. No such thing. There is only the legal entity. It exists only on paper. It has no brain, no mind, no physical form, no motor functions, nothing. Everything it does, it does through the acts of an agent and the will of an agent. That agent is a living, breathing individual, okay? Or collection of individuals, like a board of directors, for instance. But in either case, the way you draw that relationship is the individual in this list of legal entities is an individual acting as an agent on behalf of one of these kinds of legal entities. That's the only way that list works under the rule of a judgment generis. Okay, so anytime you see a definition that includes the term individual with a list of legal entities, then they're still talking about acts relative only to legal entities. They're not talking about a man acting on his own for his own private purposes. They're talking about a man acting as an agent for some legal entity for some legal purpose. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting this uh the 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 all caps name you know versus the the individual and the individuals the legal fiction well, again, um, the all caps name has nothing to do with this. The capitalization of the name is an argument that will get you nowhere. The courts have ruled against it a thousand times. That will never get you anywhere. Okay. How they fill out the paperwork, unless they put ink at the end of your name or co or something like that, they are not trying to make you into a legal entity. That's just not the way it is. Now, they may be trying to identify you as an agent of a legal entity, as we just discussed, but they have no actual evidence in support of that. They only make the claim, but they never provide the evidence. Never. It doesn't exist unless you happen to be incorporated under your name to act like your own private trucking company or something like that. Okay. Uh, but then it's not usually under just your name. It's under something like your last name slash trucking company or transport and shipping or something of that nature, like uh, Craig Transport or Craig Transport and Shipping or Craig Shipping uh, or Craig Commerce, whatever. But it's not usually just Eddie Craig 
the corporation. And the thing is, is simply putting your name that way on a piece of paper could not make you a corporation no matter how you slice it. There is no argument in the world that will make that valid. Why? Because in every state of the union, there are very specific pieces of paperwork that must be filed in order to create an incorporated legal entity of any kind. They are called Articles of Incorporation. And for the various types of corporations you can get, LLCs or anything like that, there are variations of that paperwork that have to be filed. If that paperwork does not exist, the corporation does not exist. Hence, they cannot be making you into a corporation by spelling your name in all capital letters. That is not how a corporation is made. Never has been, never will be. Here's a comment from Star. She asks, what is supreme law? What does it boil down I to? I believe you believe the religious folks. The laws okay. of God, the Ten Commandments, if you believe the religious folks. But in a society, the supreme law is the structure set up by men as to what's superior law. For instance, here, when you're talking in our justice system, no matter what state you're in, the supreme law of the land is the actual constitutions. The federal constitution is supreme in whatever areas the federal constitution delegated specific power to the federal government. And then following that, the state constitutions are supreme within the individual states, except for where a specific power was granted in the federal constitution to the federal government. Everything else was left to the states or to the people of the states. So within the federal arena, the United States Constitution is supreme. Within the state arena, the United States Constitution is supreme only within the area of the 18 enumerated powers given to Congress, and everything else is supreme under the state constitution and the state constitution alone. Then you have federal law, as long as federal law does not violate the 18 enumerated power restrictions. Any federal law that is not part and parcel uh, under one of the 18 enumerated powers has no effect within the states, ever. The only way it can get there is for the state to create legislation that adopts the federal law into state law. I see. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's how most of your state motor vehicle codes came into existence, is an adoption of existing federal law into state law. Interesting. Okay. Uh, it's how a lot of your state business and commerce codes came into being. All right. It's how, uh, for instance, here in Texas, our business and commerce code is the codified version of the Uniform Commercial Code at the federal level. And even the, even the title of that act in statute specifically says that under the business and commerce code, this code may be referred to as the Uniform Commercial Code. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the difference there is, is that when a state adopts a federal law and creates it and brings it into state law, the state cannot create exceptions or variations of the federal law within the state. It's an all or nothing deal. Uh, so when the state deviates from the design of the federal law, that can be challenged as the state acting outside of its lawful authority beyond the realm of the federal law that gave it the authority to act in the first place, if it actually did, which in many cases it didn't, but the state took it up and used it anyway. Now, this is the problem with the people of the state not understanding what their legislature is doing. Most of the regulatory codes that exist within your states are based upon federal codes, specific federal legislation that was implemented at the state level so the state could get bribery money from the federal government to keep it in place under the guise of federal funding. This is how your police departments get money. This is how your road and bridge uh, organizations get money. This is how your public schools get federal money you name it. If there's federal money involved in a state level entity, 
It's because that state level entity is under the operation of state law that adopted federal law to implement it. Wow. Uh, there's more to come back to on that question, but before I forget about this other interjection, um, when, uh, when someone is injured, like uh, I was injured in uh, California. Well, I was injured. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, the statute of limitations in terms of uh, a police brutality type of thing. Um, there's also there's civil rights. There's uh, injury. Particularly, I'm curious about, because I think it's like a, usually two years for civil rights. It's like it, one year it, for the... There, there's state level statutes of limitations, and then there's federal level statutes of limitations. Federal level is two years. Some states are two, some are one. Here in Texas, it's one at the state level. So if you don't file a state suit within one year, you lose it. If you don't file the federal suit within two years, you lose it. So that statute of limitations starts ticking at the moment the interaction has been finalized. Whatever caused your injury that you're suing for became final. That's when your clock starts on that time. So that means if, like, for instance, they had you under indictment for five years but never prosecuted you for it or they had a criminal complaint against you for five years, but never prosecuted you for it until they either convict you or you are declared not guilty. That statute of limitations clock has not started. It's only when that case becomes final, either through dismissal or by acquittal that the clock starts ticking. What is that called? Uh, what would you, what would you call that uh, exemption in the uh, where they're they're doing something against you and is that tolling? It tolls the statute of limitation. Yes. And then there's another uh, another exemption for mental illness. I think mental incompetency. Uh, well, it depends. Once again. That only works in certain cases that I'm aware of. Uh, for instance, fraud itself has no statute of limitations until the fraud has been discovered. Once the fraud has been discovered and you've addressed it, your statute of limitations starts. But it can be 10 years before someone finds out there was actual fraud. And then once they find it out, they can file for it, and that's when the actual clock on it starts ticking. So it doesn't matter whether it's criminal fraud, contract fraud. That's That works the same in all cases. Fraud has no statute of limitations until the fraud has been discovered. Then the statute of limitations clock starts. I know um, I've, I've called around a lot of attorneys in California, you know, shopping the case around. And, you know, this, this goes back to 2009 and, uh, you know, they're like this, you know, it's just, it's too far gone. You know, they won't, they won't, won't take it, but I'm like, but they've been, they've had a, they've had a case against me all this time. And it's only just recently disappeared from their books on, on online, you know? So it just seems odd that yeah, but uh, a disappearing from the online listing doesn't make it an end of the case. You have to get something that's a signed order because without that date showing when that order was signed, there's no standing for them to take a suit. You understand? That's what they're looking at. Okay. You say they had a case against you. You didn't bring me anything that shows when that case was dismissed. And that you say it started five years ago. Well, where's the paperwork that says when they dismissed it or you were acquitted. If you don't have that signed order one way or the other, there is no end date. And because there is no end date, you don't yet have standing to go after them. Hmm. Um, let's go back to uh, Star had some other things in that question. And then she has another one after that. 
Well, I've Anything seen a question. It doesn't matter if they uh, write my name in all caps or in all lowercase. What matters is if they use it in association with me and have my permission to use it. Well, that's a misnomer. They don't need your permission to use it. What they do need is for you not to rebut the presumption that what they're trying to do by putting you into some legal capacity, if it's under a regulatory statute, uh, is not to rebut it. If you don't rebut it, the presumption will stand. Under a criminal statute, and by criminal I mean one in the actual penal code, not the regulatory codes, but under an actual penal code statute, they don't need your permission to charge you with a crime. All they need is evidence of a crime. And that's it. If that was not true, any murderer could say, I don't give you permission to use my name. Therefore, you can't prosecute me for murder because you can't put it on any of your paperwork. That just wouldn't work, would it? Um, well, I guess you're reading my mind from, you know, uh, maybe other discussions we've had or something like that. I have registered a service mark of my name. It's kind of a feeble attempt of, uh, of, uh, you know, trying to throw a wrench in the, in the cogs or whatever. So, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't thrown that into those cases yet. Uh, and, you know, notice of, of that, that is my intellectual property, but it's something I've been, I've been thinking of doing. What? Well, I think we had also addressed this in the last show we did. You cannot copyright or register an individual's name. And it's not your intellectual property. You did not come up with your name. Your parents did. If it was intellectual property, it would be theirs, not yours. Actually, I did pick I did pick my middle name and I, I chose to be adopted by my uh my dad. So I got I got the the, the William Baker part. <laughs> we're part of well, my doing. You got the William part. Yeah. Not the Baker part. Baker was his name, right? Yeah. And it was his father's name before that, right? Yeah. And then his grandfather's name before that, right? Yeah. So it was whoever changed it from Brzezinski to Baker who actually has the intellectual property claim, whatever century that might have been. You see what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I mean, as an example, not that it was actually Brzezinski, but you get my drift. Okay. So if that was 15 generations ago when your family got known officially as Baker, that's not your intellectual property. It was not a concept created by you. But the courts have already ruled on that anyway. The courts have said you cannot do it. It will not do any of the things you're thinking about doing. Okay. Um, now, as far as the rest of Star's question here about um, what does it boil down to, legislation or common law? Well, if you look at most state penal codes, you will find, as we also discussed in our previous show, your state penal code, not your regulatory codes, but your penal code. Your state penal code is the codified version of the common law. That's all it is. It's the codified version of the common law. Every crime, with the possible exception of the hate crime scenarios that they've got scrapped into them now, but murder, assault, fraud, theft, conversion, all of the uh, tampering with evidence and, and records and things like that, that is all common law offenses that are now in a statutory scheme. And the reason it's in a statutory scheme is so that there is uniform enforcement. The law reads the same for everyone all the time so that it's not up to a judge to say what it originally meant or what it originally said. They all have to go by the same statutory writing. They don't always do that but it's what they're supposed to do. Okay. So as far as the common law, the common law has been replaced by a penal code system in every state. The common law itself used to be unwritten, which was a problem 
because this judge would say that this offense required these elements. This other judge would say it required those elements and they may or may not match. Then they would say the level of proof needed is this in one case. And then over in a different case, all the level of proof is real high. And over here, it's real low and so on and so forth, which actually sent people forum shopping so that they could get the right judge to hear their case so that their threshold was as low as possible to prove it. And it worked for prosecutors as much as it did for defendants. And in criminal cases, the defendant doesn't get to shop, the state does. So in order to stop that kind of thing, they codified the common law. So it appeared across the state the same way for everyone. Same elements, same burden of proof, same essential evidence required, all of it. If you were actually charged under the common law the way it existed prior to that, you could get put in the stocks in one town and you could get stoned to death in another for the exact same act. Okay. okay. The codification was designed to prevent that. Now, the rest of her question is some claim a trust is constructed and so on and so forth. There is no straw man and no trust is going to keep you from being criminally prosecuted for a criminal offense anywhere. Not going to happen. The people that are selling that crap is are literally fertilizer salesmen because that's all they're peddling is crap. That will not prevent you from getting prosecuted anywhere, ever. Good. Here's that. Uh, I, I told you about the, the wording on this. Um, let's see if I can zoom in on it. Uh, let's see. The mark consists of a, let's see. Do, 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 do. The name shown in the mark identifies a living individual whose consent to register is made of record. Um, and you said who, who issued this? It's the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office. Okay. Well, in our previous discussion, I told you that there are certain cases where the name can be used for commercial purposes, such as the way baseball players patent it when it comes to signing autographs or for uh, um, sport memorabilia companies like uh, trading cards and so, and so on and so forth. Yeah. They will trademark that individual's name for those commercial uses, okay? But if that same player can be sent to court, charged with a crime, and his name will appear on the documents, and he will just be just as prosecutable as anybody else, and that company will have no case in trying to sue because his name got used on a legal document. None yeah, of their I mean paperwork will protect them or that guy in that case will not do it. They have no cause of action and he has no affirmative defense that you can't use my name to prosecute. Do you have uh, any knowledge about how, I mean, I've, I've just got a bunch of ideas of, of how they're creating, you know, they create a bond uh, and then, you know, you're, you're paying 10% of that. That's what they do. And people have sold that idea to lots of people. In some instances, that may be true, but I have yet to see any evidence that it works the way that the people that are peddling this crap actually says it does. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Let, let's start with the birth certificate BS. Okay. People say the birth certificate is actually a bond that sold you into slavery the moment your parents signed it. Where do you get that idea since the Constitution specifically outlaws slavery? How does that work? How does a piece of paper violate the, the Constitution in every manner possible by selling you into servitude to someone else when those are acts that are specifically prohibited by the Constitution and the laws of the state themselves? So how would that work? It's a stupid argument. It's, it's, it's a completely stupid argument because common sense says it can't work that way. 
All right. You've got all these other things that show it can't work that way. So where did you get the idea? This is what they're doing. Oh, well, it's because there's that little number at the bottom that says this piece of paper actually came from a bank. No. What it says is, is that you got a paper supply that may have actually been put into publication by a bank who may own the publishing company that supplied the paper that your county used to print your birth certificate on. That's what it says. Now, where is your evidence that that is an actual number on some bond firm? Oh, well, it's on Dun and Bradstreet. No, it's not. No, it's not. Dun and Bradstreet is a private entity that registers centralized numbers for corporations or businesses. And you don't have to be an incorporated business to have a Dun and Bradstreet number. This is something else that I've debated with people before. I've even got an article on my legal blog at that address you had up there with my name that talks about exactly that, the Dun and Bradstreet fallacy. And it goes into great detail of explaining why that is. So I won't do that here and waste a whole bunch of show time. But the fact is, that's not an argument that's going to get you anywhere in a court of law, ever. It's not going to do it. And this is not coming from an attorney. I'm not an attorney. I don't claim to be an attorney. I don't want to be an attorney. Attorneys have limitations I don't have. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean I can do bad, worse things than an attorney. It just simply means that I don't have to worry about having my bar card yanked by defending myself. I don't have to worry about certain kinds of sanctions because I'm not somebody that can be gotten for those sanctions. Now, other sanctions I can, such as contempt of court and things like that. But when it comes to ones that only apply to licensed attorneys, they can't hit me with any of those. Yeah, I think I saw something else from Star. She says, if it comes from me, it only relates to those who did no crime. It's, in all my cases, not someone who's trying to get out of a crime they did commit. How, how can they force me to be their defendant when I'm just about my way, harming no one? Well, the thing about it is, is you wouldn't be a defendant if someone wasn't accusing you of doing something that violates the alleged law. The question here is, is does your actions violate the alleged law? So once again, if you want to truly understand whether or not that's true, you first have to understand the law they're attempting to use. What are the definitions that apply to the terminology used to construct the law? What is the surrounding context of that law? What is the overall picture of the law as a whole that deals with the specific things that you're that are being used against you or being used uh, definition-wise to place you within the realm of that law, et cetera, et cetera? There's a plethora of things that have to be taken into consideration, not just what they put on their little piece of paper. For instance, one of the things that most prosecutors are guilty of and most defendants don't have any idea about is that there are specific things that a complaint and an indictment and an information must contain above and beyond tracking the actual statute. In other words, a prosecutor can't charge you with an offense by simply writing out the statute as a series of events that show the individual elements. There are other specific details that the case law has said has to also be there whether they're in the statute or not. Okay? Uh, a good example of that... That would is, mean the, sufficient, the sufficiency of... The charge. The, yes. the charge. sufficiency of the allegation and the supporting charging instruments. Yes. Those are called the individual elements. And the thing about the elements of a charge is, is that they cannot miss any of them. In any criminal case, there are a specific set of elements. There may be three, there may be 50. But no matter how many there are, they must prove every single one of them that is pertinent to that offense. If they miss even one, the charge falls flat on its face. 
So until you understand the law and everything about that law, you don't know whether or not they've proven all of those individual elements. You don't know if they've asserted all of those individual elements in the charging documents as the law requires them to do. Because if they don't, then they violated another right of due process, which is proper, sufficient, and timely notice. Why? You were not, it was not proper because it did not allege all of the required elements of the offense. Therefore, you were not able to properly prepare a defense against that element or to rebut the existence of that element before you even got to trial. It's not sufficient because it's lacking. Therefore, it's not sufficient. It's not timely because it was never made prior to going to trial. Therefore, the element cannot be introduced at trial as a part of the offense because it was not alleged in the instruments used to charge you with the crime itself. Thus, because your proper and sufficient were violated, your timely was violated. You see how those all connect? It's all very have- logical when you dig into it far enough to understand how the, the system's actually designed to work. Now, I'm not saying it's designed to work properly, and I'm not saying it's designed to work as efficiently as it could, but this is more or less how it is designed to work. All right? So once you understand that structure and the things that they have to put in place to support it in order to proceed forward, then you understand where their weaknesses are. When you understand their weaknesses, you know where to attack. And knowing is everything. Well, it's almost everything. There's knowing, and then there's also applying what you know. And in order to apply, you've got to have the munitions required to do the job. And by munitions, I mean countermanding evidence, knowledge of the law, the ability to cite precedent or other authority that negates what they're trying to say or prove. In other words, your counter bullets. They shoot at you, you shoot back. The first one to score the hit wins the point. Okay, and this very much works like the movie Wanted, you know, where they shoot the bullets at each other and then they collide the bullets so they can't hit the targets. So they stop the bullet by shooting it in midair. Wow. Well, that's kind of what you have to do in that courtroom. They shoot at you, you fire your bullet back, that countermands theirs, boom, they collide in midair. And that never makes contact. So you've destroyed that bullet and it never hits you. Therefore, their case fails. Now, that will not work for each individual bullet. But once you start hitting multiple bullets and destroy the elements of what they have to have to support their case, they're done. Um, Just some things I've heard along the way. Uh, when you get into an encounter uh, or, or some sort of thing, you know, try to build some things that'll help your attorney or your lawyer or whoever's helping you out are like a time, a, writing up a timeline of what happened so you don't forget it. Uh, anything else like that? Um, yeah, well, the, the more documentation and evidence you've got available to give to your attorney, the more they can help you. But when you start trying to give him certain ideas about legal process, he's not going to want to hear it. He's already got the process he's going to follow, no matter what the law says. And he's going to follow that process, regardless of what the law says, because it's how the court he's having to appear in wants the process to be. And this goes back to what I said earlier in the interview. If you don't know what the rules of procedure are, and you don't know what the rules of statutory interpretation and league and creation of laws is, then you won't know when the court is using the law in a way that hurts your case instead of helps you like it was intended to, or deprives you of a right that the court was required to protect instead of depriving you of it. So when your attorney says, well, they're not going to do this because they, they're going to do this, this, and this, and you know what the rules of procedure and the rules of statutory construction are, you go, wait a minute. They can't do that because that violates this provision of the Code of Criminal Procedure. 
If they do that, that violates this right that belongs to me. It also violates the rules of statutory construction according to the way the legislature said it had to be done. So how are you saying the court can do this and it not violate my right of due process? Well, it's just how they do things. I'm sorry. That's not an acceptable answer. As my defense attorney, your job is to protect my rights, not to go into court and waive them because it's what the court wants you to do. Okay? Yep. Now, the moment you have an attorney that's doing something like that to you, I'm going to tell you how to make sure that you will never, ever be hauled into court from that day forward. Okay? I want to tell you how I fought a friend of mine's drug possession case. They were trying to charge her with 15 to life. Okay? For 2.2 pounds of methamphetamine that the Bear County Sheriff's Drug Task Force used a confidential informant to plant in her house before they raided her and charged her with its possession, which they also did prior with three other people prior to doing it to her. All three of those people got sent to prison. All three of those people had attorneys that went in and let the court throw their rights out the window and got them to take a plea deal and get sent to prison, blah, blah, blah. They didn't challenge any of it. But with my friend Ruby, I said, we're not going to play that game. Here's what we're going to do. I wrote out some legal pleadings for her, and I said, before they give you an attorney, you file these documents, one of which was a motion for speedy trial. Okay? The second one was a notice to be given to any attorney that they assigned her or that she paid money to or that wanted her, her to pay money to them. And that notice basically says, very plain and simply, I hereby demand that you uh, protect all of my individual rights at all times in all ways possible to the best of your ability. You are not to waive any of my rights without my express written consent. No matter what the right may be, you are forbidden to waive it without my express consent. If you fail to do number one and number two, I will bar grieve you for every instance that you have done so, or that you have done something that I feel violates one or two. And then I will sue you for legal malpractice at the end of it all. And I will use those bar grievances as evidence of insufficiency of counsel and malpractice on your part. Do you still want to take my case? <laughs> the very next appearance in court, if you've got a court-appointed attorney, that attorney is going to run straight to that judge and beg to be released from your case. He is going to absolutely beg to get off. Okay? Sorry, I've got a trainee here who insists on sitting in my lap while I'm doing this. That's fine. Um, but you do that, that attorney is going to beg to get out. And the judge is going to grant his request for removal, okay? And you need to rebut, you need to argue back. Objection. I don't want him off my case. I have a contract with him. You assigned him as my legal counsel. He is supposed to represent me to the best of his ability as my advocate. And all I did was demand in writing that he do that. And now he's asking you to let him go because he doesn't want to do it? I'm sorry, Judge. Did you give me a rigged, fixed case by giving me a lawyer you knew wasn't going to work for me? Is that what you did? You appointed an attorney you knew was going to screw me over on behalf of the system and the state? I object to that, too. They will never get you into court. From that day forward, they will never be able to get you into court no matter how many attorneys they assign you because you're going to do the exact same thing to every single one of them. Now, remember, you filed a motion for speedy trial in the very beginning. Every time they dismiss your attorney, they have to wait till they can get you new counsel. And that speedy trial clock is still ticking. 
<laughs> so every time they throw out the attorney and they get a new one and you do the same thing to that one, the process just keeps on going over and over and over again. Because none of these attorneys, unless you gave them a million dollars up front, are going to fight for you. They're not going to. They want the simplest, quickest, money-making route out of this as possible, especially if they're court-appointed counsel. This is why justice can only be bought. It cannot be had. Okay? You don't have deep pockets. You will not get an attorney that's willing to do the work necessary to protect all of your rights without ever waiving any of them. Why do you think the cartel cronies get off so easy? They got endless pocket change. Okay. Why do you mm-hmm. think the wealthy get off with a slap on the wrist? They got endless pocket change. Okay. You or me, however, we're the ones going to jail when we're convicted of crimes because we can't get a lawyer that will fight. He's more ready to take a deal. And he wants you to take it with him. Why? Minimize the work, maximize the profit. That's simple. Because he gets a fixed amount of money for your case, no matter how long it takes. No matter how much it costs. He only gets a fixed amount of money. Here's uh, a continuation of Star's thing. Every case of brutality and denial of due process are complicated. And my current case has surrounding factors that complicate things, plus the fact the case was dismissed and sealed. Is that an admission that they had no case to begin with? No. And without knowing the basis of why it was sealed, for instance, did it involve a juvenile? Okay. It was outside of school. Something relative to juveniles. Uh, did it? What did it involve that they would seal it? Okay. Uh, those are questions that have to be asked. Plus, you can ask that the seal be removed for the purpose of discovery if you're going to file suit against them for it so that you have access to it. Hmm. It can be to hide the case from scrutiny. It's what the chi- it's what the family courts do in child uh, protective cases all the time. They don't want the judge's uh, acts being scrutinized by anybody, so they seal the records of the juveniles in certain cases or certain records of the entire family court proceeding because they're screwing over one or both of the parents in favor of the system and the money. I said it before, I'll say it again. As far as anything outside of criminal law goes, family court is the most corrupt, morally bankrupt part of the legal system there is. Second to them is the probate courts. Their entire job in probate courts is to steal as much for themselves and the lawyers as possible from whatever state is under probate before. That's the entire goal. Hmm. Suck it, suck it right down to the bone marrow for as long as possible. If you possibly can. Yeah. I hear a lot of, a lot of things about people with, uh, in family court and stuff, and it's just very sad. Um, I, I guess I should ask you a little bit about my one other case I've had. It's uh, in a, uh, Wisconsin, and uh, uh, they've had it open for since 2008. And uh, I challenged jurisdiction in there, and uh, and the the judge, I think he put me away for contempt of court, and had had me arrested. And uh, well, anyway, this this stuff is is hard for me to deal with. It's just it causes so much uh, anxiety inside my brain, and. Uh, you know, I just can't bring myself to come to deal with it. The the money's too much. I mean, the judge put like a ten thousand dollar price tag on the um, on the contempt part of it, 
and even but even before that the the da had offered me a hundred dollars in six months probation well then you can move that the judge's contempt is cruel and unusual and vindictive i i why did he charge you with contempt you didn't throw the uh defense table at him or something did you what i said uh is that you know i i said can i may i there's something i said about entering the court may i enter as a special appearance and i don't really know what that means someone just suggested i do it let, let me and, ask you this prior to saying that in that court that day had you done anything else in the case yeah i i i showed up i was there all the time they they the trial date yeah, came you and showed up and you were there did you ever get called and address the court yes okay that's the problem when you go to court special appearance always always has to be the very first thing out of your mouth otherwise you are there addressing merits and merits nullifies special appearance a general appearance which is what a merits debate is okay a general appearance nullifies stay out of that nullifies a special appearance immediately so you cannot do both if you fail to make the special appearance each and every time you enter the courtroom then it's considered a general appearance by default and the moment it's a general appearance all prior requests for special appearance are nullified so you never open your mouth you never address the court until you have made special appearance okay and I that's see. where most people mess it up they go through and they do all these things and then the day of trial i'm here by special appearance oh no you're not <laughs> no you're not you may think you are but you're not you 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 sunk that ship long time ago you ran it aground and it's filled with crabs and seaweed now it don't it don't float <laughs> filled with crabs i what i sold it what i told him is i said before i can proceed any further this court must prove that i volunteered political jurisdiction and he asked me my address and i repeated myself and he said lock them up and uh well, then that's grounds to how that judge disqualified. That's not proper judicial conduct. See, that's another thing you need to be familiar with, the judicial canons. When a judge acts in a way that violates the judicial canons, especially when it is a refusal or failure to be fair and impartial or to act prejudicially without cause, that right there is a disqualifying requirement or a disqualifying act, okay? And once they do that, you can immediately move for their disqualification. In most states, the judge can rule on his own recusal, but he cannot rule on his own disqualification. Some other judge has to rule about whether or not his actions disqualified him from acting any further. So you file a motion to disqualify the sitting judge and get him removed. But make sure you have a good legal basis for it. By citing the judicial canons and the specific act the judge perpetrated, you believe to be in violation of said canon or canons. When you file your motion to disqualify with the higher court or the administrative court that oversees that judge in that court, then they will rule on whether or not your argument holds water. If they rule for you, the judge is removed from your case as is any orders he entered he he disqual or he uh removed himself from the case and uh put it and put moved it. to quash his prior order moved to quash his order because his order was vindictive and without legal justification thank you mm-hmm um well i i know you've you spent a lot of time with us today and i appreciate it very much mm -hmm. uh 
it's Does, it, did star get all of her questions answered i think I uh know. yeah i think she did i've read why they seal cases to protect the actors but it's yeah, also i've like already addressed the case from uh from that um i could show you what i did for her page um remedy and and i did this to kind of cap capture all the evidence for her Maybe there's something uh, that I could have done differently. Collected uh, all these uh, YouTube videos about the arrest. And again, she didn't harm anybody. She just refused in Colorado to, uh, to identify herself because there was no cause of action. Um, okay, what state was this in? Colorado. Okay. Colorado is not a stop and ID state. So what crime was she being charged with or suspect uh, or being suspected of having committed before they asked for her ID? Um, um, I could dig into the paperwork and, and show it. It's right in front no, of I'm us not, here. I'm not worried about the paperwork. You said you've got videos of the arrest and everything. Yes. What she, was their basis for the arrest? Was it failure to ID or were they charging her with some other offense before they even asked for her ID? Um, they thought she was suspicious because they were she was in a white van parked outside of a school. Okay, suspicion is not probable cause and nor is it a basis for identifying in Colorado. In Colorado, right. they have to identify a specific crime. Suspicion is not a crime. Suspicion is neither a misdemeanor nor a felony. Yeah. So it, it ended up being dismissed. Well, of and, course, uh, she sued. She's they're, they're they're working they're working on all this stuff to to do that. And uh, an attorney, an attorney. Uh, one in particular said they were too busy or something, and uh, which was strange because the attorneys had a former client who was calling us up and saying he wanted to put her in touch with the attorney. And uh, well, the way Colorado's going, he may very well have been too busy to take on another case. Hmm. The way, the way Colorado law has been changed, the cops up there are getting sued left and right for breathing wrong, which is good. Because usually when they're breathing wrong, it's because they're out of breath from doing something illegal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, this brings to mind another question. If if it's, yeah, the video, she says the video went viral and it, and it did. Um, and uh and it did so i'll send you that that link so you have it um this brings to mind another thing when you can't find an attorney to represent you uh can you can you sue the bar association no. so that they appoint somebody no you're not entitled to an attorney for a civil suit you're only entitled to an attorney for a criminal defense. Hmm. Well, but then in terms of when things are to tolling and you're running out of time and you can't. Well, that's always the way the game is played. That's why they set the, the see, it is my opinion and belief the founding fathers never saw a limitation for a constitutional violation. There should be no statute of limitations. Okay. For a constitutional violation. If they did it at any point, they should be able to be held accountable for it. Once somebody gets the case to file, but that's not the way they did it. They wrote the law in a way that gives you a specific amount of time to go after the government for doing wrong. And they said it as short as they could possibly get away with and make it work for them. So you may have to go out of state shopping and get an attorney that can practice in Colorado 
or that can work through a law firm in Colorado and do that. Or you may have to go outside of a specific area you were where the incident occurred and go to some other part of the state. Colorado Springs or Boulder or something like that, or Denver, wherever was not the place that it happened. All right. But I find it hard to believe that with all of the ability to sue law enforcement up there, that there is not an attorney somewhere in the state that won't take the case. It's too easy of a slam dunk with qualified immunity having been erased by the legislature. Cops in Colorado no longer have a defense of qualified immunity. So they're real easy to sue and real easy to win because there's almost always evidence. Okay. And so if that video went viral, you've already got evidence. As long as all the charges against her were dropped, she's got multiple cases here. Malicious prosecution, rights violations of various kinds, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, they pulled a taser on her and threatened to shoot her with it if she well, didn't see, comply. That's, that's uh, that right there is excessive force. The moment they touched her without probable cause and put her in cuss, that is an illegal use of force. Because without probable cause, they can't put cuffs on you. Reasonable suspicion is not grounds for cuffing you and stuffing you in the back of a cop car. They have to have actual probable cause of a crime without that that's an illegal seizure it's a 14th and fourth amendment violation the whole nine yards then you have the aggravated assault part of it which is the actual crime they committed by doing it so your causes of action are malicious prosecution false imprisonment uh excessive force uh and you know any other rights violations that would go along with that but they've actually committed crimes themselves, aggravated assault being one of them. If they took her from that spot in that cop car, aggravated kidnapping is another one. Official misconduct. Okay? Any of those penal code crimes could be charged against those cops if you can find a prosecutor that would be willing to do it. Yeah. She wrote, uh, I hope Eddie will review the case, but there are 10 body cams from different agents. They had me in cuffs for well over an hour, shackled me three times, five court hearings over four months. She was in prison for 15 days uh, without, I think they said without charges. And uh, I, I saw in the paperwork there were some charges, but... Uh, they they wanted the the DA wanted to drop it and the judge wouldn't drop it until she was present in the courtroom. Uh, you know she was out. Uh, you know out of state and zooming in, you know for a teleconference type of thing. Okay, Star, I see this whole list of things you've typed up here. My question is: is out of this long list, how many of them are actual penal offenses and how many of them are actually actionable rights offenses? See, this dishonor you've got up there, is dishonor codified as a cause of action in Colorado or as a criminal act in Colorado? If it's not, it doesn't belong in this list. It's not going to help you. Breach of good faith, is that a cause of action in Colorado for a police action? Is that a criminal charge in Colorado? If it's not, it doesn't belong in this list. Ignorance of the law is not a criminal offense. It's not an actionable offense unless it's accompanied by some other thing that is actionable due to their ignorance, such as the uh, malicious prosecution, such as the Fourth Amendment seizure and the 14th Amendment seizure, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these things you've got listed up here aren't necessarily actionable, either criminally or civilly. So step back, take your emotions out of it, and look at what the actual criminal offenses are and what the actual civil litigation causes of action are. And stick with those. Don't go into some attorney with this long list of stuff and say, I want to sue for all this, because he's going to look at this and go, most of this stuff is not a cause of action. It's not even a criminal offense. It's, it's, it's nothing. I can't help you with this. 
And he's going to gloss over the things that you do have a legitimate claim for. Because he doesn't see you as a reasonable person with reasonable expectations. He's not going to want you as a client. Go in there with a very short, specific list that is in absolutely no way in doubt based upon the actual evidence. He may find more to add to it. So in this case, going in with less is actually more. Find the most egregious ones that you can actually prove based upon the video and documentary evidence and go to an attorney with those and say, Aren't there also criminal charges that I could lay against these guys like the aggravated assault, the aggravated kidnapping, the uh, abuse of official capacity, official oppression, things like that? Aren't there actual crimes I can charge these cops with for what they did? Now, you accusing them of it and some prosecutor taking it up and actually doing it, that's a whole other animal. But right now, that's part. That's your secondary concern to getting your civil case heard. Here's a little bit of what it looked like. Uh, Color of law, which is Title 18 fraud. Yeah, I've, see, I've seen. This I don't know what you're talking officer. about, but in Colorado, this is the law that we have. Sir, so step out. Under color of law. In the state of Colorado, you have to tell me what your name is. <laughs> okay, and you said you saw it. That right there is a lie. If they're actually charging her with an actual criminal offense, then, and they're arresting her for it, or they're detaining her for it, and your law in Colorado says that in a detainment, you have to give them your information as long as the detainment is lawful, then she was required to do so. But if they're just telling her that they're going to arrest her because she won't give them her information and they have no other criminal conduct to go after her with, they're screwed, and they know it. If that's the case, that would not surprise me as to why they sealed the case. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if you've got causes of action, you can get that seal removed and use everything from that case as evidence against them. Yeah. I just hope I hope something comes of this uh, this. Uh this thing because we had you know the, the the bakersfield police back 2009 man they really messed me up tried stomped on my head and everything and uh and uh i haven't gotten any anywhere with that uh except to um call them out you know publicly I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble <laughs> juggling all this stuff on the screen. There you are. There I am. Laura, I thank you for the compliment. If I'm saying your name correctly. Hmm. I, I am one of these guys that I spend a lot of time doing this. I study this day in and day out. I'm not a lawyer. I've worked for some as a paralegal, but I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be. And I would never, ever tell somebody I was, even if I was a lawyer. Why? I don't want that stigma in my life. But at the same time, I will not go into court being the most ignorant person there. I don't go into anything I do being the most ignorant person there. If I'm going to go and participate, I'm going prepared. And if I don't go to prepared, then I fully expect to get my ass kicked. No ifs, no ands, no buts. But that has not happened in a very long time. So you have your, uh, they can, people can go to your Tao, Tao of Law um, page and they can learn uh, about uh, the courses, the course that you offer. Uh, well, they, the, the Tao of Law is my legal blog. It's just got a bunch of articles I've written dealing with Texas law and things like that. Some, legal arguments and theories I've devised over the years based upon the statutory and uh, case precedents on certain things like terminology uh, of resident versus uh, domiciled or abode, uh, things like that. 
plus actual uh, cases that I've dealt with and put up arguments about and some of the paperwork for that. Uh, I fought all kinds of cases, drug cases, assault cases, uh, evading cases, uh, traffic tickets, uh, simple assaults. I, I mean, you name it. I I've helped people fight all kinds of cases. As long as they're willing to listen and do exactly what I tell them, they usually win. It's when they can't follow instructions or decide to do it their own way, they wind up losing. And it's also why I tell people, do not ask me to recommend an attorney to you. I'm not going to do that. One, I don't trust attorneys, not even the ones I work for. Okay. I will never, ever recommend an attorney to anyone. Why? One, I don't trust them. And two, I'm not going to have the person come back and blame me because their attorney screwed them over, which they're habit prone in doing. Okay. Because you don't know how to control them, which I can't teach you if you're not willing to listen and follow my instructions. So there you go. I'm not going to recommend them. <clears throat> but for the most part, I, I just today finished purchasing a domain that we're going to base a website off of. It's called criticalthinker.media. And that's going to be where I'm uh, hosting a bunch of the stuff that I'm currently uh, trying to get put up on my YouTube channel. I just got my new computer system built. I'm in the process of redoing my office where I can sit down and start making content videos over legal uh, things that I do here in Texas, the various law and charges and how to go to court and fight it and all that kind of stuff and get those posted up on my uh, media channels. But they'll also be hosted on my own website Critical thinker dot, uh, not thinkers. It's singular. Critical thinker oh. dot media. Ta -da. That right there. Okay. <laughs> and we're also uh, going to start one where we've got a phone based app that goes with it. it's critical thinker dot app app. That will be the other one that's up there with it. Um, and then uh, I've also got one other domain, which is TV. And that was what I was originally going to use for the videos, but it sort of limited my radio show versus my videos and all this kind of stuff. So I just went back and did critical thinker.media to cover all of it. Nice. And I may have the TV as a subsection of critical thinker.media. Well, this one works for now. Um, I, uh, I'm very, uh, very grateful. Uh, for the, for you coming on the show today, um, I, I think it was really good. We we were off to a little bit of uh, uh, some horrible technical problems in the beginning. I I apologize, and uh, so we we got off to a late start. And I know you've got other things to do tonight, so I think it's probably time to let you go. Uh, yeah, I've got to do my class here at eight tonight, so I've got to get ready for that, and I got to get this little fellow outside. He's been in my lap for this whole show. <laughs> It's about time for him to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, uh, thank you. And if, if there's anything I can I can do to help in the future, let me know uh, in in some some way or whatever. Mars asking to see the puppy. This is a eight month old. Um, what are you? I forget. Huh? I forget. What are you? This is Finley. Okay. Finley's here <laughs> for body training. He's got he's got uh, excitable bowel or excitable uh, bladder syndrome, so I'm working <laughs> on helping him deal with that. But he's a little Pomeranian, and of course I got several others here right now as well. Uh, I've got a big Malinois German Shepherd mix, who's about the size of a Great Dane, and uh, then I've also got a pit bull slash. Uh, boxer mix that i'm fostering till i can find a home for him uh, anybody want that one let me know please uh eddie at rule of law radio.com e-d-d-i-e at rule of law radio.com but you're going to need to be in texas to come get him oh <laughs> uh, well great um yeah star gave a link to the uh playlist of the cops uh what what they did to me and stuff as well in in the in here uh she did she did that for me back then and then i did 
I did the, uh, I compiled a lot of stuff and put it up online for her. In, in this case, you know, we both, we both have seen how incredible, how incredible, um, uh, stressful it is when these things come against people. And uh, just so you get an idea, Eddie, of some of the things I do with the tuning fork, I can, I can help people re really relax and I can help dissolve. Sorry about that ringing in the background. Um, I can help dissolve traumatic triggers on people's timeline that, um, you know, would other otherwise uh, cause them all kinds of, of grief. Like with stars thing, it was about almost a year ago. So I, it was getting far enough back where I could work on it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the other day I was clearing hers and her boyfriend's uh, traumas from, from that whole experience. Um, I, know, I know firsthand how crippling it, it was in my experience. And maybe I've just got ADHD or some kind of thing, but it's been really hard for me, except when I'm up against a really tight uh, deadline. And then for some reason, I can I can write code like I can write 18 pages of shit in in you know two hours time or something, but other otherwise it just isn't there and uh, and I I get up and I walk I pace around and I can't sit down and and stay focused on writing the the paperwork and stuff. So anyway, I like to try to help people wherever I can with being able to deal with that kind of trauma. Uh, so if that ever co comes in and somebody seems receptive to that type of thing, um, uh, I might be able to do something. I have a model of my own about certain kinds of people. And I always say there, there are people in the world that need a high five in the forehead with a five pound ball peen hammer. And usually it's attorneys. And I am the guy that makes every attorney turn around and stomp away in a hallway in a courthouse. Okay. I've had, I've had them argue with me till they were blue in the face. And I'm just sitting there going, well, you forget this and you forget this. This statute says that it doesn't work the way you're thinking it does. So if you read all of this stuff, then you're wrong. Well, anybody with half a brain would see it my way. And I would say, you're absolutely right. All it takes is somebody with only half a brain to see it your way. Somebody with a full brain, however, sees it differently. I'm sorry. I don't want to have to explain that joke, but a lot of people just simply don't get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Star says she hopes she can have a conversation with you sometime. And, um, uh, well, thanks again. I will, we'll see you, uh, Okay. See you well, around. To answer your question there, Star, about the attorney, and I, I know Joe wants to go, but real quick, go. every state has a state bar website. And on that state bar website, you can search for attorneys that specialize in a particular type of law. Okay? All you got to do is go on there and look for a civil rights or uh, uh, attorney or rights protection attorney. And make sure it's not a business-related right. It's an actual civil-related right. And you can get an entire list of qualified attorneys to call to look at who specialize in that specific thing. Use that resource. The bar made it available for a reason. I don't like the bar. Don't support the bar. Don't think it should exist. But if they're going to give you something to hang your hat on and use to your advantage, take advantage and do it. So just do a search for Colorado uh, State Bar website on Google, and you should be able to find it. Cool. That's uh, that's golden. That's golden right there. <laughs> okay. So excellent. If that helps, I'm happy to hear it. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Y'all have a great See day. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.